Welcome to The Weaver Sews. I'm Daryl Lancaster. Cloth is cloth. I get asked a lot about working with handwoven cloth and what special things I do with it that I wouldn't do if I were working with, say, a fine cotton shirting. Again, cloth is cloth. Woven cloth has a grain, and whether it's a commercial or handwoven, everything I do with a handwoven cloth, I'd probably do with commercial cloth, and vice versa. But there are some considerations, and I'm happy to outline them in this basics video. I've already covered grain lines, sewing with the grain, cutting out handwoven fabrics singly, and transferring marks to handwoven cloth in previous videos. Those are some of the really important things to know. But what type of pins do I use? Do I use a walking foot? And even what stitch length to use? Are all things that I know from experience uh, and maybe will help you make your own choices. Much of sewing, once you understand the physics, behind working with woven cloth and the body can be subjective. Whatever works for you, your equipment, the style of the garment you're making, your type of cloth, and most importantly, your personal ergonomics will come into play here. And your budget. Not everyone can afford a $3,000 sewing machine. Nor do you actually need one for sewing garments with handwoven cloth. A competent straight stitch machine will do, and I have many, many students who come to class with a 50 pound monster machine from the 40s or 50s that are still going strong. As long as that machine is maintained and used once in a while, there is little that can go wrong. So let's talk machines. I get asked this a lot. There are some features that I prefer depending on the brand. Um, my favorite is anything by Janome. Please note that I'm not being sponsored. This is just a personal favorite working on many, many, many different brands of machines and classes. But I also encourage people in the market for a new machine to find a sewing machine dealer near you and check out what they offer, sit down at the machines, and brands that they carry and see what they can do with the fabric that you like to work with. Take your handwoven scraps with you. Some machines are more intuitive than others. Working with a local dealer, no matter what brand they sell, you know, creates a great relationship for parts and accessories, classes, and general maintenance. I'm partial to a machine where you can see the bobbin before you sew. And because my eyes are getting old, I prefer a machine with a needle threader. This is a basic low-end Janome. My main machine is a Janome Professional 6600 from about 15 years ago. There is about a thousand dollars difference in the price between these two. They both get you where you need to go. I do, though, want to point out a really important feature that not every brand of machine has, and that's the presser foot lifter. All machines have that, of course, but Janome's and many other brands also have an additional lift if you push the lever up into the machine. So here's the fully raised foot. This is the normal up position, and this is the down position. And you can see how easy it is to get stacks of fabric under there. I find this feature so invaluable that I am frustratingly annoyed when I sit at a student's machine in a workshop and their machine brand doesn't have that feature. I put thick stuff under that foot and the ability to lift that foot even higher than the up position makes or breaks the desirability of a machine for me. The ability to have a walking foot option also is important to me. Some machines come with a built-in foot, like my professional Janome.
which can be disabled. And brands like Faf, which have a built-in finger that moves the fabric along behind the needle. But a walking foot, whether built in or an add-on, is a terrific tool for a hand weaver. And here's why. So let me do a demonstration with my hands first to explain what actually happens when two layers of cloth go through the sewing machine. The bottom layer is being fed by a set of feed dogs which drop down into the machine, come up with teeth, and move that bottom layer of fabric along. The top layer is being compressed with the pressure of the presser foot coming in from the top. And so those two layers are actually not being fed evenly. That's where the walking foot or even feed foot or dual feed foot comes into play, depending on what your sewing machine manufacturer calls it. So here is a walking foot. This is a part that uh, you can usually purchase for most machines. It is shank specific. This part will hook to the shank of your machine and it is specific to your brand. Most domestic machines right now have a short shank, which this will fit. But there are others like the old Singer Slant and a high shank machine, like the one that's on my professional, where this would not fit. The needle arm will straddle the actual bar that comes off of your needle. It's the one where you would unscrew the little screw and the needle will then drop out and you can change it. This straddles that arm. So what happens is when the, ar when the needle goes up, the arm goes up with it. And then what happens is the whole foot lifts off your fabric and an interim set of feed dogs drops down which is timed to work with the feed dogs underneath. So both layers of cloth are being dually fed or evenly fed by opposing feed dogs. Note that the walking foot is just a foot that has a specific purpose. It isn't to be used all the time for every sewing situation. It doesn't handle fine linings really well. Um, for those, you might want to work with a straight stitch foot that will give real support to the fabric. Now, see how convenient this is to be able to lift that presser foot all the way up? And don't forget to lower it completely. For those with a manual machine, one that doesn't stop up or down automatically when you stop sewing, like my professional machine over here, um, I want to point out the biggest cause of machine mess ups, or the nightmare bird's nest, as it's sometimes called. This is something that I learned when I first learned to sew more than a half a century ago. But sadly, some students in my classes never got that memo. There are a number of moving parts in a machine, all timed to work together. They work together to create what we see is a stitch. Obviously, there is a needle that goes up and down, and it is timed to work with the bobbin. Um, beneath the bobbin, um, the hook rotates and grabs the thread and allows it to interlock with the thread coming from the needle. The third part of the team is the take-up lever. Often overlooked, but the most important team member. This take-up lever peeks out of the top of really almost all machines. Um, it's there in every machine, but there are a few where it isn't visible because there's a covering over the top of that whole, whole area. And that's an issue in my opinion. In an electronic machine, like my professional, not seeing the take-up lever out the top isn't so much of an issue because the take-up lever always stops up or down depending on the setting. But in a manual machine, like this one, 
The take-up lever stops no matter what position it's in. Instinct is to wind the flywheel on the side of the machine, always in the direction it spins, usually forward, but there are some older machines where it spins in reverse. Just know that. Um, until the needle is clear of the fabric. Actually, this is wrong. The flywheel should be wound until the take-up lever is out the top of the machine. And you can see right now that even though the needle is up, the take-up lever is not. So I'm going to continue to wind the flywheel, let me grab my threads out of the way here, until the take-up lever is all the way out to the top. And then the bobbin case has returned to its starting position. That means the stitch has finished and the fabric can be safely removed. Always start and stop with the take-up lever peeking out the top of the machine. Your machine will be so much happier. And while I'm at the machine, this small presser foot size piece of black electrical tape will easily guide where you stitch. It leaves a, a very negligible residue, if anything, which can be easily removed with alcohol or goo gone. But this is an indispensable aid for, for accurate stitching. The black against the silver throat plate is really helpful and it is repositionable until it doesn't stick anymore and then you just get a new piece. Let's talk stitch length. Every machine has the ability to control how long the stitch is. Really long stitches, four, five, or six millimeter stitches, if your machine can do it, are usually considered basting stitches. They hold things together temporarily to eventually be replaced with more permanent stitching. If I were doing some reinforcing stitching, I would turn the stitch length down to what I call barely moving forward. You know, maybe 0.5 millimeter. Somewhere in between though would be normal stitching. And this is somewhat subjective. I'm a fan of 10 stitches to the inch or two and a half centimeters. It's usually close enough to hold average handwoven fabric together, but not so close to be impossible to rip out. Because truthfully, yes, even I make mistakes. And when I do, they are the, usually the dumbest ones you can imagine. How do you know what 10 stitches to the inch looks like? Stitch along a piece of paper with contrasting thread and measure how many stitches you see in one inch. Note on the machine what that setting is. In the case of my professional genome, I was able to reprogram the default setting to always come up 10 stitches to the inch, which in this particular machine is 2.7 in the controls. Sewing machine needles are a sort of personal thing. I tend to buy Schmetz needles. I am not being sponsored by them. It's just a personal choice. Um, they are reliable, easily obtained. Don't use cheap needles. They aren't always accurate in their specs and they can really screw up a machine. Actually, just as a sidebar, if you're having trouble with your machine, change the needle. You'd be amazed at just how much a needle change can, and rethreading the machine can help. There are three general types of sewing machine needles and then a ridiculous amount of specialty sewing machine needles. If you ever find yourself bored in an afternoon, you can search the Schmetz website and there are a remarkable number of sewing machine needles for all kinds of specialties applications. Who knew? Anyway, three general types of machine sewing needles. 
The first is a ball point. These work well for knits, which can be snagged by a sharper point. The ball point of the needle will slip beside a yarn. The opposite of that would be sharps. Schmetz calls them microtex. These create precision top stitching and perfectly straight stitches because the needle pierces whatever is directly underneath of it. Somewhere between these two options is the universal needle. It's not a ballpoint, but it's not a completely a sharp. I particularly like them for sewing hand wovens. They are sharp enough to pierce a yarn, but not so sharp that they will jam up trying to go through slubs and novelty yarns. If you look at the sizing on the needles, there are two numbers. The first number, in this case a 90, is the European size of the needle, referring to the thickness of the shank of the needle. And the second number, in this case a 14, is the American size because we like to have our own sizing for everything. The bigger the number, the fatter or sturdier the shank. I find that the universal 90 size 14 good for general work with hand woven fabrics. And I usually buy these by the six pack. Using a 110 size 18 needle might be appropriate for hemming jeans, but it's too thick for a fine silk lining. Choose a 75 size 11 for sewing that type of fabric. Incidentally, change your needle often. I have read that the industry recommendation is after every five hours of sewing. Yeah, really. Um, not when the needle breaks. And this is especially important working with hand wovens because for a reason that I can't completely explain, hand woven cloth is particularly hard on anything with a blade or a point. Sewing machine needles, rotary cutting blades, Shears, serger knives, all dull much more quickly when using them on handwoven fabric. Pins. You might think, why is this a topic? You might have a pin cushion or box that has every pin that has ever come into your house, no matter how appropriate for sewing. I've seen students' pin collections From the tiny pins holding men's shirt collars in place when packaged to hat pins all in the same holder or box. Pins vary widely in their purpose and function. In general, working with hand wovens, I pick the longest, most obnoxious headed pin that I can find. Uh, the length is really helpful for thicker hand wovens and the bulky, say, yellow plastic head of quilters pins helps to keep the pin from getting lost in the garment. And just as a, a side note, always pin parallel to where you are cutting and perpendicular to where you will be sewing. And don't sew over your pins, really. I have judged a fair amount of fashion shows featuring handwoven garments in my lengthy career. At least once during every judging session, I get stabbed by a pin inadvertently left in a garment, really. Sometimes they're sewn in so deeply that we have to take apart the hem or facing to actually get them out and so that they won't stab the model that night in the fashion show. Use the most obnoxious pin that you can find. I rarely lose these yellow-headed quilters pins. And this flower head pin will work too, though I find the head gets in my way. These glass head pins are super long and elegant, but the heads are harder to see and they can bend easily.
The quilter's pins, of course, are much harder to bend. These are fine silk pins. I generally would only use them on fine cottons and where I don't want the head of the pin to interfere with my work, like pattern drafting. My most preferred pin for general sewing of non-handwoven fabrics are these fine dressmaker pins with small white glass heads. And I keep each type of pin in a separate magnetic pin holder. If you use a magnetic pin holder, make sure your pins are steel, otherwise they won't stick to the magnet. And of course, a more popular offering are these wonder clips. They're offered in two sizes. They are particularly well suited to leather and suede, um, like the uh, embroidered leather yoke of the dress that's behind me on the form. I talked about polyester versus cotton thread in a previous video, the one on hand sewing. You might want to check out that discussion, and that video also covers hems. I hope that this has given you some basics for working with handwoven cloth. I cannot stress enough how important it is to really practice with your tools and equipment. Sewing is a skill that improves like fine wine with time and practice. If you haven't sewn in a while, that hand memory will come back, but practice will make it happen much faster. I'm Daryl Lancaster for The Weaver Sews.